Hey, so today I've got Phil here, and Phil McSweeney's the author of Angel Think, and a pretty awesome guy. Uh, this is being recorded, and it's going to go live tomorrow morning on my brand new YouTube channel, and it's basically a founder breakfast. Every day from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. UK time, I'm going live. I'm going to use a bit of this interview just tomorrow to get it started, but after that, I'm going to be getting live guests on, and we're just going to be chatting, and it's basically going to be what you're doing today. You know, can we improve your mindset, and can we sharpen you up and get you started? So... Um, well, I guess we best dive straight in. So I know you've prepared a list of questions, Phil. I didn't read them because I wanted this to sort of be as authentic as possible, I guess. So, okay. Okay. so I'll let you, I'll let you start. Well, no great surprises in the questions, I don't think, but yeah, no. thanks for having me on. And I didn't realize I was going to be some kind of pioneer in this, um, yeah. kicking off a new process. So, so that's nice. So yeah, let's, let, let's dive straight in. Um, I know a little of your background from uh, contacts over the months and years, uh, and particularly from your podcast interview of yourself <laughs> and some exchanges that I've had with you about that. Um, and great initiative, by the way, and I, and I thought, yeah, that's, that's quite clever. Um, <laughs> But give us an overview. In a in a sentence or two, what do you do? What does Inverse do? Um, what brought you to where you are in life now? Yeah, sure. Um, and thanks for watching that solo interview. I was getting frustrated because every time I did something, it was more about how do you make a winning pitch deck or how do you make a, you know, what's your tips for writing a good business plan? And I felt very shallow talking about that stuff. Um, ultimately, Phil, I see myself as a fundraising co-founder for early stage businesses and i mean that by i care as much as you do and i allow you to get on with the business essentially so what a fundraising co-founder does or someone like me um does is we basically build investment strategies and we make sure we've got all the collateral to back that up funding as you know and i'm presuming as people know who will be watching this is a bit of a mixed bag in terms of challenges it's mainly around you know a preparation and B, putting yourself out there. So I really just help with both of those things. And Inverse is the company with my business partner, Ivan. And it's basically our vehicle to try and help startups in as many different ways as possible. Okay. Um, I, know, I know Ivan not as well as you, but did you start Inverse before Ivan arrived or did you conceive it together? <laughs> um, so Ivan and I met working ivan had been working at crowdcube he was a senior compliance officer for four and a half years so really on the um, pitch breakdown side reviewing claims etc i was working for a company called overfund um, which provided crowdfunding services mainly video and then i started to do the um the accelerator so i would deliver the whole crowdfunding round and they would deliver the video I met Ivan because we got so busy, Crowdcube were like, oh, this guy's just left our team, you should work with him. So Ivan started under, sort of underneath me as a, like, you know, I was just using him to write campaigns and we did about 40 crowdfunding campaigns together. And I remember I was in the um, pet shop near my house in Spain. We still have pet shops with live animals in and that's not so common as much anymore in the UK. I was in the pet shop and I remember ringing Ivan and saying, hey, should we just do this ourselves? I mean, <laughs> um, and, and that was it. So we basically both left, started in verse, realized, oh, damn it, we've pulled the rug out from our own leg underneath our own feet, basically, because um, we had it pretty cushy there, I'm not going to lie. Um, mm -hmm. We had a solid stream of campaigns, you know, it, it was excellent. Um, but, you know, when you've got that founder rich, you've got that founder rich ultimately. So now I rang Ivan and yeah. said, do you want to start something together? And we just kept it simple, 50-50, straight down the middle. Okay, let's start with what we're going to do and just build it up from there, really. If you've got an itch, you've got to scratch it, haven't you? And it's just how it is, really. Yeah, well, I was... Um... I had a bad experience in business, which I'm sure we'll cover later on, uh, but I had a bad experience. So I was always in that mindset of, I never want to do this again. I, re mm. I just was done. I was completely done. And then, you know, working for someone else again and sort of building my confidence up again, I realized I 
I did want to do it again. Um, and I, then yeah. I realized I didn't yeah. want to do it again alone. So I was really on the lookout for sort of a six month period for that right sort of person who would complement my skill set, um, which is very forward facing, entrepreneurial, marketing, etc. And Ivan just seemed to be the perfect fit for that. And we are, we're like two yeah. jigsaw pieces ultimately. More, I mean, more generally, how important do you rate having a co-founder is? Um, it's not for the faint-hearted um, yeah. at all. It's 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 very difficult, and you know, Ivan would echo this. This isn't me, you know, speaking out of turn. It's because you know, it's very impossible to align on absolutely everything all the time. You know, I have crazy ideas that I'll wake up in the morning and think, "Wow, this is the next big thing for Inverse," and you know. We've got to go in that direction. And Ivan will just look me in the eyes and be like, nah, you know, we're not doing that. And that is hard. You know, that takes a lot of um, respect, confidence, trust. Um, and those things aren't easily earned. So I, I think having a co-founder is great for a mature business um, when you're trying to now take it a bit more seriously. But I wouldn't have worked well with a co-founder in my early days, I don't think. And to be honest with you, I didn't really need one then. I wanted to be yeah. a bit more dynamic in my decision making and, you know, attack trends, etc. Yeah. I think that kind of um, chemistry, I guess, is, is really important. And, 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 you know, there's the almost good guy, bad guy kind of thing isn't there you know somebody's yeah. crazy somebody needs to kind of balance level level be level-headed whatever and, and then you come to a, a good decision between you yeah well it's it's difficult because ivan isn't a natural ideas person he's not a product guy you know or he's yeah. not a product person at all so ivan would never call me into a meeting in the morning and go yeah. hey <laughs> this is the direction for the company now so in a way, yeah. it's harder for him because he has to say no a lot more, where it's harder for yeah. me because I have to respect that and try and chill it out a little bit and be a bit more reasonable. So I, I definitely think that um, I, d I don't know if there's a way to test it, but, you know, I just jumped double foot in with Ivan. I think we're quite lucky that we sort of had the chemistry that we did. But yeah. uh, I, I can see what I, I don't mm. know the statistic, but I know it's very high for co-founder breakups and disputes. Yeah. Do you think you'd struggle to go back to work for anyone else now? Um, no, no. I think that what I've learned is I'm, I'm an excellent number one, so I'm a great leader, and I can really, you know, enthuse people on my. That that's about being a leader, isn't it? I can go on a call yeah. with a with a software dev or a unbelievable business person. I can tell them my vision, and they'll believe me and want to join me. So I think that's yeah. a great. A tribute, but mm. I've taken, you know, since 2018 now, I've sort of been a number two because I sit in that number two role in other people's businesses. And that's yeah. actually where I excel a lot. I've, I've realized that myself. Um, I didn't, when I was at school, I didn't do schoolwork. I didn't do homework. Um, I never did coursework. I've only got five GCSEs. Um, and the one that I did get was totally thanks to Mrs. Nicholson because she did most of it for me or with me. Um, and I think because of that, I kind of maybe have saved my <laughs> my energy for later life. And now I'm just like, yeah. a dot, I'm a machine. So yeah. I, I could, for yeah. the right person, you know, a really top, top entrepreneur, I think I could be a co-founder or, or second in command, definitely. Okay. So coming coming to Inverse in particular, what, why did you choose this? I mean, you, you probably had hundreds of ideas, you know, coming in and out of your brain. Um, what's so good about this idea for you? I think for us, Inverse is kind of... Um, it definitely serves a niche. The first thing we get told often when we talk about serving pre-seed startups is that they've got no money. You know, oh, they've got no money. You don't want to work with them. They've got no money. You know, you should go do Series A raises and you can get paid well off those companies. So we love that, you know, because that's where the vast majority of businesses are. They're at that very early stage and they, you know, the the one-eyed 
man is king in the valley of the blind basically so you don't need to be the biggest expert in the world you don't need to have mm -hmm. this huge software stack you know you can really just add tangible value through conversation almost so yeah i love where inverse works which is the early stage we tried to keep it quite generic in terms of you know what we do offer because i'm quite rounded ivan's extremely rounded um but we've kind of found ourselves now in this investor outreach because that's the worst bit of, you know investor outreach is just the worst bit for every business so we've yeah. kind of landed there along with sort of a bit more but as inverse as a product and as a business that's where we're really driving it so other ideas i'm not you, you'd be surprised i'm not really that type of person who has business ideas every day of the week because i've got extremely good discipline um so it does i don't really allow my brain to waste energy on that sort of stuff features and products within inverse absolutely but if i was thinking yeah. oh i'd i'm a negative person i i always say that to my clients when i start with them i'm like look if you're expecting me to come into this and be this person who is going to you know, tell you everything's great and tell you your idea is amazing. I'm just not that person. I'm very, very negative. I think that comes from being burnt so many times. Someone online yeah. wrote to me the other day and said, hey, Jamie, I'm thinking of starting a landscape gardening company and um, we're going to get about 30% margin. We're going to subcontract it out. Um, you know, it's going to be a lifestyle business. I just said, no, it's not because you're relying on really high skilled labor outsourced. You're just always going to have a problem with that. It's always going to be a negative experience for you. You're going to go away on holiday and your main contract is not going to be available and you've taken a deposit to do someone's garden. And so my brain naturally thinks in that way um so yeah I, I i'm not actually a business ideas type guy okay what what makes you passionate about this idea in particular um helping people definitely helping people so i was left in a state where um i just had nothing so my business collapsed after vc funding and you kind of look around at that moment of what you can do and you realize it's way too late. <laughs> you know, the, the, the executioner is already being called. They're already prepping the stage, you know, for the grand execution. It's not anything you can step out the way of. And I, I realized yeah. at that point, I wished there was somebody who could have guided me by torchlight. So my dad always said after to me, um, because I've learned, I'd learned a lot after. My dad always said to me, could you save yourself? You know, if you go back now, could you save yourself? And I believe the answer to that is yes. So that, that's kind of what drives me. And that's why I'm passionate about Inverse because I can just, you know, we've done 60, 100 companies now that we've raised and the ones that have failed have failed nicely. And I take, you know, a lot of comfort in that, that the one, you know, it, uh, some of my mates will always joke, oh, well, you know, the ones you've raised funding for, like how many of them actually survived? And I'm like, well, it's not about always surviving. It's about not dying. And I mean, personally, you know, it's about, you yeah. know, the founder getting out cleanly, not burning bridges with investors. So there's lots and lots of stuff that gets wrapped up within that. But for me, yeah. the passion 100% comes from just, you know, I can just mm. get involved in people's businesses and I can help them as much as I possibly can. Yeah. Okay, you paint a pretty graphic picture there of executioners. So but let's let's not go there. <laughs> Founders are, I guess say founders are pretty desperate to secure funding. You know, they're, they're that's the of, problem. They've got they've got a burning idea, and they 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 just can't. You know, every waking and almost every sleeping moment, they're thinking about it, and you know how they can get going. You might argue there's too many of them. You know, too many founders. You know, and there isn't enough money in the world for everybody's half baked idea to be funded. So it's all a bit kind of. Darwinian almost, you know, those best adapted to survive are going to get there and, and others aren't. But and there, there just seems to be so many people suggesting different pathways to to get funding. You know, some are helpful, some less so. You can go on a platform, you can join an angel group, you can do speed dating, you can join an accelerator. And it's all a bit of a I almost feel sorry for early founders because it's all a bit of a maze, really. There's a, you know, you, you wouldn't know where to go. But but what's your kind of preferred advice for people 
starting out looking for funding? You're absolutely right. There is not a one size fits all and there probably never can be because ultimately it just doesn't work that way. For me, you know, when you said there's too many founders um, or there's too many businesses, maybe, I think that actually sort of comes to another level, which is there's too many founders who have almost found themselves pot committed. And I use that poker term in a sense of if I've got a hand and I put a couple of chips in, I'm way more likely to bet again on the next hand, regardless of what comes out. You know, it's just once you've started to pot commit, you're always more likely to. And that's what I see from entrepreneurs. They overcommit way too early. So that's taking money from friends and family. And once you've done that, you can't just suddenly turn around and be like, hey, it didn't work. You have to literally drive that thing into the ground so you can stand up and say, it didn't work. I tried my best and everyone goes, oh, you know, fair enough, basically. So yeah. I think it's a bit of a balance. My number one, my preferred route, and if I could design fundraising for all um, businesses, it would start very simply um, – with a community fundraising round, so something like a Kickstarter, an Indiegogo. I'm considering making a platform for that really early stage, just donation-based, where you can kind of launch a crowdfunding-style campaign, but business-focused. Um, crowdfunder, yeah. etc. do it, but again, it's all just a bit of a... It's all just a bit of a money rinse, to be honest, as everything is in this space. Um, but I, I think those early validations should be done from customers. You know, can you... All products need customers um, or stakeholders. Um, you know, even the med health tech ones, you need stakeholders from within the trusts, the CCGs, the hospitals, you know, and can you get that buy in um, early stage? If you can do that and you can get that validation, then I think you should go into a friends and family round for equity. And then you've sort of got a bit more momentum behind you. I don't think you should go to friends and family at that idea stage and say, this is what I want to do. So I think there just needs to be a bit of a step before taking money, selling equity. That's sort of like a validator, a test. All people really want to know. And I always joke about this saying, you know, someone should have a domain called is it any good.com where you just send your half baked business ideas and someone just says yes or no. You know, people, they only really want to know that question. So, yeah, I think it needs yeah. to start with community validation before, you know, oh, can I sell equity to my friend or family? Which normally the answer to that is yes, but then you're way over committed. So it's a, yeah. it's a balance. That's interesting. I, I mean, I'm not a poker player. I've never never had a go i'm not so, either but i I'm get not. i get this term pot committed and kind of you know how how you kind of feel mentally obligated once you've yeah. kind of started and, and you've put some risk out there and then you kind of dare not fail it's you know you, you just don't want to step back from it so I'm, but I'm I, not... I, yeah and i also get this idea of um uh I suppose what i would call market pull really you yeah. you've got to attempt to demonstrate that there is a need um, and the market is going to pull you towards it or pull your idea towards you know what what you're trying to offer and I, and I see so many people um, go out and try and raise money with with a pretty poorly tested idea yeah um, well that's exactly so, it. I I think that yeah. ultimately the, the you know the whole starting a business thing Selling equity to friends, family, local investors, LinkedIn investors, um, accelerators, etc., or even you know pre-seed VC funds, doing that that isn't validation. And ultimately, all that happens is you end up with a 50k MVP, and then you have to go back and do that first step that I've spoken about. I I do think people have got the order at the early stage mixed up. You know, first thing should be create yeah. your brand, build some brand equity. You know, Ivan and I have been building our brand equity now for years, and we don't even really ask for anything. You know, we don't drive people to landing pages. We don't run ads, you know, but we're just chipping away, building product market fit. And then when we're ready to now overcommit ourselves, and then we'll do that. But we, we've never done that. So I think it's very interesting. Okay. So let's, let, if I start with um, beginning the fundraising process with you, the founder comes to you and says, Jamie, um, I'm looking for help to fundraise. What what are the next key steps you take them through? 
Um, the first one's expectation setting, and that's even for the team as well. You know, it's not just for me and my engagement. It's like, what are you actually trying to achieve here? And, you know, sometimes saying that out loud, and you always hear, it's always the same, oh, well, that's the next thing we're going to cross off, but we think it's going to be about 2 million, you know? And it's like, okay. Um, so the first thing's always that expectation setting, and then looking at the time on, on the clock and saying, okay, well, it's, you know, first of September tomorrow or whatever um, it may be, where does that actually leave you? So you've got first September, say that it takes you four weeks to get ready, October, six weeks outreach, November. We're now in December, forget December and January. So it's February. By the time we close, it's March. Is that okay? <laughs> you know, if that's what yeah. happens, is that yeah. okay? And understand, you know, watching the reaction to that, tells you a lot especially when you've seen it a hundred times plus um most good businesses have got burn where they can skeleton until sort of way beyond that but it's not comfortable and they're the best ones so my first is always that sort of difficult conversation around expectations timeline management understanding then i guess it's the maximum viable product methodology which is okay for the least amount of resource what's the maximum we can achieve from this is that you know again sometimes the most fundraising that we do comes from existing shareholders because we we look at it and go okay we've completely neglected that relationship if we just spend a month building that relationship back up we can then mm -hmm. most most investors who are already on the cap table say no to reinvestment because they're the first person that the founder goes to they start from the top to the bottom of the cap table and they go to their top investor and they go hey we're opening a new round do you want to come in and the investor goes oh, i'm not going to follow on on this round but good luck and keep me updated what they're basically saying is look i've already done one fundraising round go and get some new like don't just use me as a cop out you know as an easy mm -hmm. option you know go out and prove it come back to me no one ever wants to be the blocker so if you know they're going to put 50k in go and raise the other bit first and then go to them and say hey we've got yeah. a 50k gap and we re really want to close that 99 percent of the time they'll close it for you so it's just you know that's often a really good place to start just understanding the current investors what the actual relationships are from there with that, so with the time allocation available, with the burn rate allocation, with the understanding of the current cap table, you can then work out what your actual true gap is. Um, and with that true gap, you can then build a plan, a little scaffolding to cross that gap, basically. So that's the, that's, I guess that's the methodology behind what I do. Okay, that's, I mean, that's interesting. And, you know, in your... <laughs> If you've done a friends and family round and that's all you've done, yeah. um, you're pretty unlikely to get much follow on from that because, you know, it, it's your friends and relatives out of love that have given you a certain amount of money and they yeah. sometimes you're not even expected expecting to be asked for more and they can't afford it. You know, they, no. they, they, they're they kind of a bit dry. But Yeah. Yeah, um, so in that scenario we've just got a much bigger scaffolding to build ultimately yeah, yeah. and it's going to be a lot more focused on presentation because they've never had to present to someone skeptical you know if i present yeah. any business to my dad he thinks it's amazing you know he's just like oh amazing you know go knock yourself out you know yeah. like go for it whereas the first time you pitch to a real investor and they're negative and cynical it, it's quite the slap in the face so we just sort of you know have to you know, again, build a much bigger scaffold, scaffolding on those ones. It's an essential quality for a founder, isn't it? Being able to accept no far more times than yes. I think. Well, I always love to read the no's. I, I, the good businesses that you go into have got a spreadsheet full of the no's and you can kind of get a really good temperature check of where they are off those. So for anyone listening, you know, write down those no's. It's the first thing I'll ask. Why did this person say no? Why did they say no? You know, and you can learn, oh, I'm not reinvesting at the moment, or I only reinvest, I'll only, you know, this is for more mature investors. Oh, I'll only invest twice in a business. You know, stuff like that I love because it it, yeah. it, it it gives you a lot of learnings. Yeah. Uh, ball, ballpark figure, you've, you've indicated this more or less already. Um, I just wondered how many raises you've managed. You said... 60 to 100 something like that 
Um, well, would, yeah. How many have, how many have you successfully raised money for? So we did um in my personal career, um so I did a VC round and an angel round in the business. So I I did one of each. Um and my angel round had elite athlete sailists in there. So I learned that as well. I then stepped out of that and went into another company um, called Care Rooms, and we did a round with Care Rooms. So I was up to three, and that was a that was quite a really cool round actually. It was um, like a heavyweight angel round. I then went into crowdfunding. I did sixty eight successful crowdfunding raises between twenty nineteen and end of twenty twenty. We've then come into Inverse after that in twenty twenty, and we've done. Oh, at least another 60 so the the true numbers north of 120 i do have a spreadsheet where i sort of track it all yeah now i hate it (laughs) i really hate those numbers and 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 ultimately i think i should only be judged on (laughs) what you've done last week because what i did in 2020 wouldn't work now ultimately that business probably wouldn't even get funding and also crowdfunding was very different back then angel rounds were very different vc rounds are very different and also as you know, I'm just a resource, effectively. You know, all I am is, you know, the person who's going to bring momentum to the fundraising department or build a fundraising team in your business. So ultimately, yeah. the business has to be investable. So I would love to get rid of all of these claims on LinkedIn, like I've worked on 100 businesses, etc. because at the end, because yeah, that's true. But the amount that you raise, sometimes it's totally skewed. You know, I did... um a raise of 2.6 million, which was one of the easiest we'd ever done. Um, although yeah. we built everything from scratch, all the documents, crowdfunding campaigns, you know, everything. It was so easy just because the business was genuinely like, wow. <laughs> so, but yeah. whereas the hardest one I've ever done was only 50K with a guy called Andre and it was a mental health app and they had nothing, nothing. And that round was like, the most painful I've ever done. So yeah, the the statistics skew, but it's well over a hundred successful raises. Yeah. Um and that just gives me variety, I think, more than anything. I mean, having said that, do you do you ever turn anyone down? Do you just say, look, this is this is just not going to be worth your time or mine? Yeah, I did yesterday. I did yesterday. And, it, you know, you can go all the way through to the process to the very end and you kind of wait for an excuse, I guess, to sort of turn them down. Um, mm. I would never say that someone's not investable because if someone said that to me, I would I, I'd run through walls to prove them wrong. So I don't, yeah. I don't want to be that person and say, oh, I don't think you're investable. I'll just kind of, you know, it's not great to say, but I'll just frustrate the process um, mm. ultimately. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. worse than that call in three months or four months' time where it's like, oh, hey, you know, we've not raised money yet. And it's like, okay, like, you know, I have to sit there and feel like justify to them why they've not raised money and why it's not my fault. And mm. and that's grim. If you, if you speak to most fundraisers, they can't deal with that mentally. You know, they, they don't last very long in pre-seed because the expectations are through the roof. People think I've got a magic potion. I don't have a magic potion. Yeah. I've got an unbelievable work ethic um, and I know the things that you should do and have in place at certain moments and I'll make sure that they're there and whether that's a network, whether that's outreach, whether that's an investor deck, whether that's a mentality, whether it's a confidence boost, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I absolutely have to turn people down and, and, and the only way you can really do that is unfortunately is to slightly frustrate the process because um, I'm not going to be the person who ever will say to someone, nah, you're not good enough <laughs> or because yeah, that's yeah, just not my yeah. place no i mean it's difficult you know and i and i kind of feel that you know from my own experience of being on a mentor advisor ned in a company whatever you know what do um, they expect you to have a magic source yeah well and you, you kind of have to accept that you you know um founders like anyone else are on a are on a distribution curve aren't they you know yeah. they're, they're, there are people at one end that are exceptional and people at the other end that are struggling and you know a lot of people that are okay but you know they they need a bit more extra effort you know extra yeah. development um uh so yeah i i not sh- you know t- so you know you end up saying sometimes 
I think this could work, but maybe you're not ready yet. You know, um, yeah. I'm looking for a bit more or, you know, show I, me a bit of more evidence of this. Well, yeah, I can't say that to people because then they say, all right, well, I'll pay you to get me ready. And it's like, yeah. ah. <laughs> you know, so it, it sort of just goes on. And again, yeah. I believe um, mm. if I've got a good rapport with the founder and I like the founder, there's a guy called Simon that proves this. Um, got a business called SPA. And it was like a fashion brand. And all, I mean, <laughs> he's called Simon Alfred. He's a really cool, wacky guy, young guy. Um, and when I first met him, his business was just awful. I mean, I sorry, Simon, but it was just awful. It was a really early stage T-shirt company. Had nothing yeah. dynamic about it. His his whole edge was just like the the off fit of the fashion. So the fashion didn't fit like a, a normal T-shirt. It was boxy cut and all of this sort of stuff. But, you know, I worked with Simon. Go on, then. He wanted, to, he wanted to pay me, and we got on great. The guy's hilarious. Yeah. And I knew that with time, consistent message drilled into him, you know, that, that he would get there. And I think with Simon, it was well over a year when he got his investment. Um, and he was never had any pressure. He was just chill, you know, and I yeah. never pushed him to do anything. It was just, look... You can, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get the opportunity. And what we're prepared for is when you get that opportunity that you don't mess it up. We are not going to be able to reach out to someone on this business and say, hey, will you invest? It's going to have to be their idea. And when it is, we're going to capitalize. And that happened. He got three guys came to him. They had um, a lot of success in NFTs. And they basically wanted to, and they're really top guys. These were doing, this was like a side project, their NFTs, and it blew up probably because they're top guys. Yeah. Um, and they basically wanted a merch line for their NFTs. And they'd seen Simon's fashion brand and they said, hey, you'll be able to make the merch for us. And Simon was like, ah, here's my opportunity. And we said, yeah. hey, instead of paying me to make the merch, why don't you invest in the company and we can make the merch together and you're now a co-owner and something a bit bigger. And they did it, invest in the business and you know so that's i'm kind of a big believer in that that you know your time will come and you just have to make sure yeah. when it does come that you, re you you're aware of the opportunity you've got your eyes opened of what it can be yeah. and you capitalize and you convert so yeah yeah i mean I'd, I'd agree with that you kind of never overlook the element of luck the element of serendipity happy coincidences yeah are you are you confident that some raises will go very well almost from the off? And what gives you that confidence? Is it, I don't know, the sector, the team, the person? Oh, it's Does the capability of the you person. Say this person looks like a winner all the way. Yeah. You just like um there's this one lady I work with, uh, Molly Aldridge, she's called. And it's like the second you get on a call with her, it's just like, wow, <laughs> you know, like high performer and everything that she does, absolute domain expert. And when you come out of those calls with those people, you're like, wow, I, I would back this person, you know, and I will back them with, with my own divided effort and love and attention and so yeah you, you it's the person it's definitely the person you just there's another one the guy called david parkinson there's so many of them um when you talk to david you're just not even listening to the idea you're just thinking wow okay you're just sharp you're clear you're focused you're determined aware of the risk you know aware of you know what you're asking but realistic you know mm. I, I you just kind of get it with some people so i think the idea to be honest with you i could launch tomorrow um a terracotta plant pot business and it would be the biggest terracotta plant pot business in mallorca by the end of three years i genuinely believe that so the yeah. idea is irrelevant it's just execution and you know determination all of those things so yeah, I definitely get that feeling, and it's a hundred percent when you speak to an outlier. When it's the other way around, where it's a great idea, and you look at the idea and you think, "Wow," your brain naturally goes to, "Okay, well, this won't be in an original thought. Who else is doing this? And are they one of those natural outliers, high performers? You know, so it's, yeah. it's a bit interesting, definitely." Yeah, and I mean, some people come along and they're. They're first time founders and you think they've got it, you know. Yeah. And you, you might expect a bit more of someone, you know, who's on their second or third business and but some people just surprise you with, with how together they are, how how there they are. Like, 
Yeah, no, it's true. I, yeah. I, when I do end this process, myself, I just don't have the bandwidth at the minute for angel investing. It's not something I would enjoy doing because I just know too much and I would need to be too involved. I couldn't just sit by and watch someone die if I'd invested in them, which you kind of have to be able to do to be a good angel, I guess. Um, you know, you have to be comfortable yeah. with that. Um, but what I'm going to do, my model, when I come out of this and I um, start to just back founders solely, is I'm going to sponsor the household income um, for three years. So I'll do 100K across three years. And for that, I want them to be free and open and adaptable. And whatever they start in that period, I'm going to take you know, a significant share in. Um, so yeah, I've got my ideas of how I can be an investor etc and what i'll be yeah. looking for and it certainly isn't the idea it's 100 percent, you know find the next me um mm -hmm. someone who's just got that you know drive to get up in the morning and just make stuff happen yeah that's interesting and i mean i i've been an angel investor for 12 13 years and i've kind of moved from being just a passive investor where yeah what happens happens and you just have to accept, you know, that some people don't make it. I've moved to being um, refusing to be a passive investor. You know, if you, if you want me to invest, then I need to work with you. Yeah. Um, you know, and I need to, if, if, if the ship's going to go down, at least let me be part of, you know, <laughs> trying, trying to keep it afloat, you know, from my own experience. But um, I don't, I don't think there's enough, um, it's definitely something I'm interested in, but I've not found the product or the vehicle yet. And that is turnaround in startups. It kind of just yeah. gets ignored. We're so quick to just let something die. Mm. There's nobody actively buying VC funded startups out of liquidation, you know, buying the tech stack, buying the brand. You know, these things have had like a million quid through them. Um, and we just yeah. let them die. They get blocked or whatever reason. So I, I do think. Um, there's so much potential out there, but yeah, that's a, that's something else yeah. I'm definitely interested in. Yeah. Um, do you have any specific relationship building advice for founders? Relationship building's interesting. I, I, <laughs> when my last business died, um, horrifically um in a fireball like a, you know the, again the executioner was waiting for me literally <laughs> literally um you know i ran a car business and the we had a county court bailiff who had a we had bearing in mind we had about a million quids worth of cars in the garage at the time yeah. um rolls royces that belonged to footballers you know um a-list celebrities um rolls royce phantoms and stuff and they were outside with this uh, truck, basically, that was going to take every single car out of my garage into a storage compound. And those people themselves with their driving license would have to go and pick the car up. Bear in mind, they weren't from Newcastle, these people. Some were from overseas, etc. So it was just impossible. So I had to press that button, liquidate. Point of the story is when I did that, I burnt every single bridge that I'd spent 10 years of my life building. Um not really through my own fault. It's just what happened. So people always ask me, why did you move to Spain? Why did you move to Spain? I wasn't running away from anything, but what I was, was just saying to myself, I don't need that anymore. I don't need a resource. I don't, I don't need a relationship. I don't need a network. I can do this by myself. And I wanted to prove that I could. Um, I deleted my Instagram, which had 50,000. I deleted my YouTube, which had 50,000 subscribers. I deleted my LinkedIn account, which I really regret now, um, which was massive. I mean, it was way bigger than my account is now. Um, and I really regretted that, but ultimately, Ivan had no network. He's a Malaysian immigrant into the UK who worked at Crowdcube. So we had a few guys from Crowdcube who he knew and I'd pressed the eject, <laughs> the, the eject yeah. button on yeah. my own network. So we, we started again with zero. Um, and there's a few people from my past I talked to. There's a guy called Gary Hunter who's out there who supported me unbelievably. Um, so there's a, there's a few of them out there. Um, who I still chat to, but they've not been involved in any way, shape or form in anything that I've done now. So when it comes to relationship building, you know, the, the key to that is just be yourself, be authentic, put yourself mm -hmm. out there. Um, and don't expect anything in return. Sit, you know, I, I've 
I did Twitch streams because I'm really into this. Um, you, you know, this is going to be my founder radio station in the morning. There's going to be no one there, Phil. There's going to be no yeah. one there. You know, that for weeks, there's going to be no one here listening to this. Maybe, maybe I'll get LinkedIn's great. It'll get thousands of views on LinkedIn. Um, but on YouTube, it'll get nothing. And I'm perfectly prepared to do that. So yeah. I think you just need to be in the mindset for relationship building. Be your best self, be your authentic self, be nice, be genuine, be personal and put yourself out there and you end up attracting, you know, people like you who see that authenticity, uh, see the rawness. You see, I'm, I'm not really after anything. Yeah, of course, I'd love to work with great companies and, you know, earn some consulting fees yeah. myself, but that's, that's, that's something else. I'm, I'm not, I've got no ulterior motive here. I'm not trying to build anything above and beyond in the background so yeah, yeah. That, that's my advice just just be yourself consistency is a lie you don't need to be consistent because social followings don't erode if you have a million followers on on instagram or you have a million subscribers on linkedin or youtube or whatever and you don't post for six months they don't search you and unsubscribe because you haven't posted you know it's not true no. um no. So, you know, it's just about posting good stuff when you feel good to post. If you look yeah. at my postings, I've averaged three posts a week now for two years, but that goes two weeks without a post, two weeks with one every day because I'm just feeling super up for it. I've not posted. I posted two posts in the last three weeks now. One was a giveaway. Um, <laughs> one was a giveaway just to promote my YouTube channel, and my one yesterday was just because I read a disgusting term sheet and I felt fired up to post yeah. about it you know so yeah just be yourself forget consistency but be you know if you want to be out there and you want people to listen to what you say you have to you have to be there you know and, and say yeah. something yeah no i think you know for um asking for money from people it, it always and it greases the ask, if you like, if you if you put some effort into trying to build a relationship with with investors. It's a tricky one, that whole building a relationship with investors, particularly because, you know, as someone who's on the other side of receiving that stuff, it's like you kind of like get to the point, you know, like, oh, hey, Mr. Jamie, how are you today? You know, how's your week yeah. been? How's inverse? Do you want to jump on a call, have a coffee? Is there anything I can do for you? It's just like, no, <laughs> you know, like, no to all of those things, you know, get to, yeah. the get to the point, what do you want? So I think there is a, there is a balance there with striking a relationship. And I think, you know, this is what LinkedIn does for me. I've got people who will email me off the back of a of a post so that post I did yesterday I had two or three emails off the back of it from VCs <laughs> you know like and I was scared writing that because I don't want to be the person who is criticizing anyone because at the end of the day it's amazing <laughs> if someone's going to give you 100k for your business that's amazing I'm not sitting criticizing that or criticizing the vehicle in which they do that um but ultimately people have re replied to me like personally and say wow you know that post and it builds the relationship so i think you know building relationship is kind of in a way you probably feel like you've got a relationship in with ben affleck or whoever your favorite hollywood movie star is you probably feel like you know with musicians on instagram there's, there's a woman called peggy goo and she's this um like techno dj and she is really intimate with her audience and she's got millions of followers. She's the biggest in the world, arguably the best in the world as well. So don't, don't confuse that, you know, the best and the biggest, but I would say that those million people genuinely feel they've got a relationship with her, you know, like personally. So I, I think there's, yeah. a, I think by putting yourself out there as well and just, I, w I was pitching to a guy um, to sort of work with him. And it was quite a heavy engagement. And he replied to me and said, Jamie, I learn more about you and the way that you work through your LinkedIn posts than I do from, you know, the the, the scope that you've sent me. And yeah. so, so again, yeah. it's like building a relationship isn't just DMing someone going, how's your week, Mr. Jamie? How's your day, sir? Is there anything, you know, it, it's, it's, ah, it's so complicated, I think. No, I'd agree with you. And I, and I think, you know, there's part of what you're saying is about how you build your authority, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, yeah. And just you put you know, yourself in a much better position to um, be um, 
attractive to someone else if you built authority in your space. Absolutely. And again, like for me, the reason I do all of this stuff is because mm. genuinely I get emails saying, thanks so much. I watched your video. Didn't like it or comment, by the way, but <laughs> no one ever does. I watched yeah. your video and um, it really helped me. And it's like, yeah. ah, like that for me is just like amazing. You know, people are getting helped. And I guess the side benefit of that is I get to demonstrate my expertise, which is yeah. good 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 for me so yeah it's yeah it's it's mm. i think going moving away from personal brand because i i i would hate to think i was building a personal brand <laughs> you know i feel like i'm just a helpline ultimately yeah so yeah it's complicated yeah, yeah. no that that's a term that has a kind of um mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah um they're talking about the two main, or what I think are the two main fundraising components that that you're supporting people with is the like the pitch deck on the one hand and the the invitation to invest, the email side of things, or the approach on the other. Um, how do you make those compelling? Um, you're in the kind of realms of you know, cold outreach, lukewarm outreach. Founders and investors probably never met each other. Um, so, you know, where, where where do you begin with kind of, you know, getting to, to be, um, you know, this is the most attractive offer? Yeah, it's, um, so I guess that if I was to go back to the beginning again, back to 2018, when I started doing this professionally, I had my opinion on what sounded good. And in a way it, it did and it worked. What I've now got is, investor opinions live in real time so i guess what what you kind of say i work with 10 people a month um and those 10 people i'm actively running narratives and outreach for i'm learning from those so the 11th person that i work with gets the benefit of me working with 10 people five doing well five failing miserably you know in sort of it compounds. So when I'm writing investment narratives nowadays, um, which is ultimately, there's only two things for a fundraising round. Ultimately is I'm going to put you in a lift tomorrow. Who, who's your idol in business, Phil? Like a, like mm. a, yeah. Who's your, who's your idol or who's your like uh, Seth Godin or something like that? Uh, probably Steve Jobs. Yeah. So I put you in in a lift with Steve Jobs tomorrow. Like, what do you actually say to him? And most people would just thump. You get 30 seconds. He's got money. He's, he'll invest if he likes it. You know, most people can't do that. And I know it's that classic elevator pitch thing. But, you know, you'd be surprised how often it's just missing. Um, so I always look at that and say, okay, let's go and get the investor in the room. Um, what are you going to say to them? And kind of work. Yeah backwards from there and make sure yeah. that's what's in the pitch deck ultimately um pitch decks pitch decks are used for benchmarking you know any good investor gets more than one of these a day um and ultimately they have to decide which one to talk to and they can't do that if it's random so you know often people get frustrated at me because i'm very much problem solution mission statement type deck narrative or deck flow and people are like oh it's so you know linear binary like it's just sort of process driven but ultimately we're trying to make something that's familiar for the reader where they can go they're not thinking about the format or what comes next they're just okay this is the pro it's very easy for them to digest so a lot of my work is always simplification taking what you've already got and what's worked okay why did that person invest oh it was because of this random reason okay is that worth coming in the narrative yes or no and you kind of build it up from there but the most important thing for the documentation the pitch etc is just making it benchmarkable outside of that it's all just outreach <laughs> it's uh, i'm not a broker there's very few people in my network who i would who i've got the relationship with where they want me to send them investment deals and these are legit investors who are like hey jamie when you get something good send me it that's yeah. not, they want to be in a way they want to be impressed by the founder not me there, there are people again where if i i mean genuinely if i put a post out on linkedin today and say again 
Molly Aldridge is unbelievable. I recommend you get in touch with her. She would have a lot of people get in touch with her, but I, I, that's not who I am. You know, I, I, I work for the business and I build the, I work out the gaps, etc. I'm not a broker. You know, investor lists are quite easy to make, and they all want to talk to entrepreneurs. So it's just about creating that authentic feeling that the investor feels like. Okay, this is for me, and if it's not for me, it's it's mass that it at least reads well. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Uh, it does, yeah. Thank you very much. And I mean, there's a follow up, follow on question, which is um, there's a lot of, I guess, conflicting information about what you put in a pitch deck or what makes it, what makes a pitch deck great. Um, I mean, do you have a kind of a rule of thumb that says, you know, every pitch deck I develop will do this, I hope? You've got some insights um, there. Yeah, I mean, if you've ever been in a successful investor meeting, which I'm sure you have, there is always this moment and you can feel it in the call or face-to-face -face where the investor gets it, hmm. whether they go on to invest or not. It's like that, I call it like that aha moment where they're like, you, you, you just what you can, if you've seen it a hundred times, you can just spot it a mile off, you know, they get it now. And their questions normally yeah. start to take a very different journey, ultimately. Um, mm. You know, it starts to become a little bit more about the business model. Okay, where does the money come from and blah, blah, blah. Before that, it's all yeah. still very high level. So my primary motive for any pitch deck is to ha get that aha moment you know as i like, can anybody reading this for the first time whether it's my 84 year old grandmother who's never worked in <laughs> she worked in cnn reception you know like yeah. can i can i send it to her um and she gets it like that that's the trick here you know um can they get it and, and ultimately people try to make they try and show their expertise but expertise truly in complex subject matters comes from can anybody understand this and can you mm. make people understand it because that's how you're going to sell your product so yeah my number one rule of thumb for any pitch deck is that the reader gets it you know and you normally yeah. see that by them either dropping out the deck or finishing it to you. It's, it's very different what the indicators are but you know i yeah. i can read two pages of a pitch deck and people say oh you never read it to the end and it's like well i got it <laughs> i didn't need to read it to yeah. i got it you know i understood what you're trying to say yeah. Yeah, um, it's interesting, it? so thanks very much kind of, so. a kind of tipping point where resistance falls away and enthusiasm kind of takes over yeah. which yeah, and that's just a base level understanding, you know. Yeah. There's this guy on um, LinkedIn, he infuriates me. He's called Alex Duns Dunstan. And, um, you know, he's very cynical when you pitch him stuff. And he just says, explain it like I'm five. And then you're like, oh, right, okay. So you then try and re-explain it. He goes, too complicated for me. I don't get it. And I'm and, and when, you, when people do that to you time and time again, you realize that simplicity is the key to unlocking everything. Um, so, yeah, I really focus on that in my decks. And, again, people get frustrated. You know, you've paid me £2,200 for something or whatever that comes out really simple simple but i'm like yeah but everyone in the world understands this now and because they understand it their brain can go to other areas excitement um etc yeah. Et yeah yeah are there i mean do you have thoughts about what you shouldn't put in a pitch deck and and then one of the issues that i come across time and again people discussing is exit strategy it always seems to be a kind of contested thing you know whether you whether you say anything about exit or, you know, whether you say anything in detail about what your exit strategy is, what, what do you think? Um, I hate diagrams. <laughs> I really yeah. hate diagrams. They, they require yeah. so much brain energy to work out. So first of all, when you see a diagram, you have to like look at it and stop the reading. Then you have to try and work out what it is and what it's showing. And then ultimately what the purpose of it is and you know blah yeah. blah blah just because i hate diagrams and i think decks have got to a point now where like it's title and diagram and again it's like so much brain wasted brain energy goes into trying to work out what the hell's yeah. going on on that slide so yeah i hate diagrams and i try and push people away from diagrams as much as possible um we did an exit slide in one recently and we got the fundraising 
advice back from the VC that we'd pitched it to. And they were like, oh, red flag, you've mentioned exit. And and I said to the entrepreneurs, look, they're not the investor for you because a big part of our business plan is the fact that we want to sell this business. So, you know, yeah. if we're building a business to sell and we're already doing that today mindfully and we're already engaging with key stakeholders who are going to buy us, leaving that out of a document is just is suicide. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. Yeah. Yeah. If you're just a fintech and you're like, oh, and in the future Revolut could buy us for 100 million, then yeah, it's kind of irrelevant. Um, but again, you know, in, investing in any way, shape, or form, um, and I used this the other day, is, you know, it's very simple. It's, it's ancient almost. You buy or raise a chicken, you fatten the chicken up, and you take it to the market and you sell it. And because you've fattened it up, you get a profit, you know, and that's yeah. all investing is. So I hate it when I see that, oh, like, oh, don't talk about exit. The only way you're going to make any money from this business is if we exit. So why would we not talk about it? I, I, think, it's, I think it's weird. I think it's weird is my answer. Yeah, I'm a, and I see kind of both sides to an argument. You know, some people say, well, if you if you focused on exit right from the beginning, you'd likely to lose focus on the most important thing, which is growth and scaling and so on. So I get that argument. But I think for investor, from an investor point of view, why would you invest in anybody if they didn't have at least one eye on how they will um you know, give you a liquidation option, give, give you a way to get your money back. So it's... Yeah, well, I'm working on one at the minute and it's doing about 400K revenue. Yeah. And when it get, they've already sort of like built the relationship with, it's a drinks brand, for example. So they've already built the relationship with a Diageo and they've said to Diageo, hey, this is the product. This is where we are today. When we get to 2 million, will you buy us? And if so, would it be at the same valuation as you've purchased these companies at? And Diageo yeah. are like, yeah, yeah, because that's, that's our model. So now with yeah. the pitch deck, we're absolutely like, hey, you know, we're a quarter of the way there. We've got another yeah. 1.5 million in revenue to get. And when we do that, we're going to sell for 20 million. Yeah. And people yeah. are, you know, do you want to come in for 100K? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. like, why would you not mention that if that's yeah. The, yeah. the game yeah. you're playing? So, yeah, yeah. Def definitely tricky. But I think, again, depends where you are on your journey mm. if you're the first yeah. investor in the door and you're fundraising at pre-seed stage and it's an idea yeah being like oh we can sell to meta like that sort of stuff it mm. it just it does mm -hmm. sound unrealistic you know so yeah, yeah. I, I think there's definitely a balance with everything and it comes back yeah. around to that there isn't one size that fits all unfortunately no. okay just to kind of you know sort of stand back you know a bit of a helicopter vision from your experience what what do you think's hot at the moment? What's died? How much more difficult have things got in the last six to 12 months when it comes to raising money? Um, for me personally, I love passion projects. So e.g. one of them is um, Fishing TV. And the guys who own and run Fishing TV, which is the Netflix for fishing, they produce content. They love fishing. So when yeah. we run investor outreach, it's like, hey, we love fishing. Do you love fishing? And either the investor's like, yes or no. And if they're like, yes, I love fishing, then we can build a rapport and a relationship with them around fishing. They obviously understand our platform. So I love working on those passion type investment yeah. projects where, yeah. it's where you see it from. So I, I always love those. And I think they'll always be able to raise money, those type of businesses. And ultimately, they'll always have a home. For me, what gets harder and harder is those, you know, businesses where they've set them up to be clever. You know, they've set them up, they've spotted a gap in legal tech or whatever. And it's, mm. you know, you're really trying to thread the needle with a fighter jet at a thousand miles an hour. And, you know, the, <laughs> the, there's so much yeah. stuff that's outside of your control. Um even inverse from the day we started inverse, you know, in 2020 to where it is now in 2023, we've gone through catastrophic market collapses. We've gone through Russian invasion of Ukraine and everything that comes around that. We've gone through crypto crashes. We've gone through all the, you know, there's so much stuff that we've gone through. And every time you do that, 
the needle that you're aiming for from 100 yards out shifts slightly to the left or slightly yeah. to the right or it gets slightly smaller. Sometimes it gets bigger. Um, but th- those businesses make me really nervous where they're, you know, taking a Hail Mary at a really small, small target quite far away in the future because, again, you just never know what's going to happen. And yeah. Yeah, they they make so that's normally stuff like fintech because you don't. I mean, again, it's like you know, I, I speak to these entrepreneurs and they're innovating a payment rail and they've got a QR code system and all of that. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, but you've got no idea what Mastercard are doing right now, <laughs> you know, with their yeah. ten trillion budget and Saudi money or whatever they've got now. You've got no idea what they're doing. And if you do, if it looks good and it tastes good and it smells good, they're going to do it themselves. So I'm I'm really nervous of those types. Um, and I love yeah. passion projects. It is, um, you know, it's interesting. You know, there are, there are always staples in people's lives. You know, they need to eat, drink, yeah. you know, enjoy themselves, have entertainment, etc. So uh, I'm going to ask you a final question, um, which it. is, a, you know, a kind of speculation into the future. Do you see any initiatives that are going to make securing investment a whole lot easier whether it be tax incentives or venture studios or the government coming up with a loan scheme or ai or or what and are there any ecosystems any anywhere else in the world that you think yeah they're doing something exciting that we ought to be thinking about in the uk yeah the best one in the world is new zealand they do a um, funding lottery basically so when you go for innovation funding instead of making you submit a pitch etc and spend a thousand hours um, you basically enter a, a lottery and if you win it you win it <laughs> and I guess that keeps people focused on their businesses I love that um, I love that a lot for yeah. me it's so obvious that 99% of people who are going through fundraising rounds think that they will have a windfall during that process personally. So they've stressed their lives to the max starting a business. And they think that when they get 150K in, they're going to see some form of windfall that's going to change their life, whether that's 25K, you know, whether it's paying off whatever, whether it's, you know, getting a pay rise. And I guess with that in mind what we need to do as a fundraising ecosystem um and what the government should be doing um personally is not incentivizing investors to invest (laughs) and i just think it's mental you know we're giving millions and billions or whatever the number is in eis and seix tax reliefs to people who have already got surplus income um to put money into startups when in fact, you know, the government should just be taking that money and just, you know, genuinely providing a universal basic income. You know, if you can take the pressure off an entrepreneur, um, you know, much the way that we do with many other things in society, and you say, go out and build a business that's sustainable and makes money, they'll do that. If yeah. you say to people, go out and raise, start a business that can raise money, they'll do that. And that's what we do at the minute. We're building businesses to raise money, which is taking money off investors and nothing ever happens. 70% of them die, you know? So it, it just, yeah, I, I think for me, I want to see, um, and I, it can never be the government, to be honest. It can't be the government who do something like that. I think the angel investors need to start backing founders. And again, I told you a, li- a little bit earlier on, for me, the model is that you basically you buddy up with an investor. So say this investor wants to do 100K into your business and you sort of have that as it goes into you. Because I believe everyone with a hack together MVP can make money. I, I think there's very few businesses, maybe some of the really complex healthcare stuff, you know, um, that you're involved in. That, that sort of stuff's a little bit more difficult, but I'm talking about the general stuff that comes across the dog sitting app, the local last mile career service app. If the entrepreneur is getting paid, they'll focus on, you know, making money, not raising money from investors. And yeah, I think yeah. that's the shift that needs to happen. We need to start looking 
more holistically around what you're backing. We've seen it. There are versions of this basically in America. I've seen it and maybe even in the UK where you take a university graduate and you give them 100K and you get 20% of their wages until it's paid back plus a premium type thing. So you're basically yeah. buying future earnings from Harvard graduates and, and that's a real thing. Um, and I think there has to be something similar with good entrepreneurs because again, I meet people who are generally outstanding. They really are really fundraising so they can pay themselves a consistent wage and get themselves back to a level where they can flourish. So why not just cut out that mess in the middle and yeah. just do that? You know, I think, I think that's really interesting. And so, yeah, I agree with a few things there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put civil servants in charge of allocating money to entrepreneurs, no. for example. Um, and I kind of see parallels with, you know, you go back in history, um, 16th, 17th, 18th century artists starving in a garret, in a garret somewhere, you know, never became famous for their work, for their art until after they died, you know, they li yeah. lived in a kind of <laughs> abject poverty. Uh, but actually, they were doing fantastic stuff. And we we need to find ways of giving those people the opportunity to to be more visible. So. I'd, I'd say the biggest, so again, this screen in front of me, it's, it's a complex relationship I've got with it and different people appear on it and we have amazing conversations all day, every day. Um, the biggest feeling that comes from it is stress and pressure. Yeah. If we can somehow remove that and the conversations that you have with people like me who have got genuinely good brains um, aren't about stress and pressure they're about you know developing innovating driving forward then i'm sure everything would level up but it's yeah. not you know it's generally yeah. people worried that they're going to lose the house it's generally people worried that they can't pay their um their food bills it's generally worry and stress so i th i think you know again yeah if we if we are aware that nine out of ten businesses fail, these are all statistics. Everyone knows nine out of ten businesses fail. Seventy percent of funded startups fail. Then, if we know that, why aren't we all a little bit more mindful of that and create an environment where, yeah. okay, don't go all in on an idea? You know, I would say this to early entrepreneurs: don't go all in on your first idea. Don't go and get the twenty k off x y and z because honestly one day you'll need that and you've already used it um you know if there's a way that we can stop those situations um yeah. then i think that um yeah. i mean the average business gets 25k from friends and family um in the uk i think that's a documented style I'll probably try and pull it out and, and um and use it in the bank of mum and dad is still the biggest mortgage lender in the world. So it's not that yeah. it doesn't exist. I just believe using it in a different way at the right time, you know, is, is so important. And if you can sponsor an entrepreneur effectively early, yeah. you know, like these people like Simon Squibb, it's like, Oh, I'll give you 5k, go start a business. It's like, well, yeah, you're going to give them 5k. The business is going to die as it, inver as it inevitably is. Yeah, You've ended yeah. up with nothing. The 5k has been wasted. Everything goes back to zero. And now that person doesn't get a second chance. No, so, no. which no, is what burnt, they really need. You burnt bridges, haven't you, in, in the process? Yeah, so, um, yeah I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I've got two kids, two adult kids, and I'm... <laughs> Sometimes I feel quite pleased that they don't want to go and be entrepreneurs and they're not tapping me up for, you know, money that I that I'm, you know, would be a bit reluctant to give them unless they had an absolutely brilliant idea, you know. They they kind of <laughs> Yeah, but it's interesting though cuz it's like what is, you know, say that they did come to you with that like idea and you're like, "Oh, I get it." Again, it's like then chaining them to that and handcuffing them to that idea and they're now yeah. going back to the beginning of the conversation they're now pot committed because dads gave them x to start this and he thought it was a good idea yeah. and i don't want to let him down and now they're going to leverage their whole life to yeah make sure that they're not in that situation and they're going to stop we call it um uh, borrowing from Peter to or robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, so they then start in that situation where they're now yeah. taking investment yeah. on unfavorable yeah. terms just to keep it moving. And people just, they don't mm. realize it, but they just start to effectively steal off their future selves. And I always say this to people, people yeah. say to me, can you work on success? 
No. And you need to get out of that mindset because you're just stealing from yourself in the future. Because when you do have 100K in the bank, ignorant you is just stole 5, 25K from that person through bad decision making, from desperation, you know? So, you know, I think that, again, you know, if, if your child, friend, relative, et cetera, came to you and was like, I want to be an entrepreneur, I've had an idea, I would say to them with my model, okay, here's 20K, live for a year, go out, you know, your ambition for this year is to try and make revenue, is to try and cover your bases, get to what, we call it wash your own face in my family, yeah. you know, if you can't yeah. wash your own face, throw it in the bin and get rid of it because it's serving nobody, zero benefit to anybody, you know, so can you get that business to washing your own face? If not, kill it, start again, yeah. have three yeah. ideas this year, try and get them because yeah. I think we all know, Phil, the businesses that take off, take off, it's never yeah. that nothing little stream it's from day one it's like oh we've got something here you yeah. know the overnight yeah. success story is fake no i mean like the 10 year overnight success story in my opinion is fake you generally launch a business and there's demand there or there isn't and if there yeah. isn't and you can't get to it within a month and you're talking about having to do google advertising etc Mm -mm, kill it, throw it in a bin, start something else. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's, that's what I think the, the mentality we need to have. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can waste too much energy on things that. Yeah, you know, for sure. I'm never going to, I'm never going to thrive. Yeah. Well, well, awesome. I'll stop that there then. If that was the last yeah, question. No, I mean, I think that's, I think that's great. I'll post all of your links below and obviously I'm sure we'll um, get this cut up and it'll be going out on your channels as well. Um, yeah. th thanks, Phil. I really appreciate that.